First, you can open your Bibles to the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 20. We're going to read verses 24 to 29, which is found on page 1078, 1078 in your Pew Bible. It's a story that you probably are used to hearing around Easter time, but today we're going to get to know the Apostle Thomas. And we have to start with his most famous or infamous story. So let's read now from John chapter 20, starting at verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, the place and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put, your, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve. But believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The word of God for the people of God. Let's be to God. So today we're going to talk about Thomas. We've been on a journey of learning about the church as it was in its early days. We mentioned Frank Viola earlier. He'd become a good friend to me, and, and uh, much of our conversation would revolve around how you, you communicate what it means to be like the early church in a, well, I hate to use the word corrupt, but basically over history, religion has taken over a lot of what we knew as the church of Jesus Christ as the apostolic tradition. So in this last year, we've been really focused on returning to our apostolic roots to try to get a grip on what it means to be Christians in this context and yet rooted deeply in the apostolic tradition. And now we're getting to know each of the apostles as well as we can. But for my sake, I'm doing this with a particular view towards how they nurtured discipleship, how they reproduced themselves so that we might try to mirror their efforts in that way. If you want to know more about the apostles, Kathy Hunt's leading a great class in room five at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings where she's diving deep into that, and I'm sure she'd be glad to have you join that great class of, of scholars and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you are grinning that I said that. We'll just let that go for now. Now, Thomas, this is the guy that unfortunately has had to live with this reputation. Uh, you know, I asked a couple of people this week as a sort of preparation for the sermon. I said, so when I talk about the Apostle Thomas, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Go ahead, somebody tell me. Doubting, Doubting Thomas. See, all of you just said it. This poor guy has been labeled, he's been pigeonholed as Doubting Thomas for almost 2,000 years now. That seems hardly fair, but the reality is Thomas is so much more than that. He's one of the people that helped spread the faith so, so, so that we would be here these many, many years later enjoying the benefits of the Christian faith. And there's, there's, there's a lot more going on with Thomas than this one moment. In fact, I think I've always been sympathetic towards Thomas because I think he's just really pragmatic. You know, he's just like, like look... How do I say this nicely? I don't want to dwell on this because it's more of an Easter topic, but, but seriously, if you've ever really in, encountered death up close and personal, I, I mean, I feel sorry for you, but I can tell you as someone who has that, that there's a lot of certainty in your mind about the death. There, there's a lot of reasons to know that this is truly the end of a life. And take in mind then what they saw happen to Jesus. It was a brutal death. And there was no question in their minds. You know why he said, I want to stick my hand in the side? He didn't literally want to do that. He's just remembering with his post-traumatic stress, watching a spear that was probably with a blade about six inches long go into his friend's side 
around the vicinity of the heart. This was a certain death kill shot, you know. And, and so the reality is, is he's certain that Jesus is dead. And honestly, you are Christian believers, but you don't expect to hear that someone who was dead is alive three days later. I mean, none of us do. So how can we fault Thomas for saying, I'm going to have to see him to be sure? So I think he gets a bad rap. And the truth is, is that he gave us two really important things in that story. One is he declared, as we all must. You remember last week we talked about Judgment Day and how it would probably come down to your impression of Jesus. And you know what Thomas said that we should all be able to say without hesitation? My Lord and my God. Right? See, the, 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 the part two of the story I ended with last Sunday is, is when God says, do you know this guy? That is your response. That'll get you in. My Lord and my God. So Thomas gave us that. Thank you, Tom. Now, the other thing that he gave us was Jesus' proclamation, his declaration that we who believe without seeing his flesh are far more blessed. Do you believe? Do you believe? Because if you do, then Jesus says you are more blessed than the apostles that knew him best. So that is what we can thank Thomas for. But now I want to take it a little bit further. Here's a little bit of a historical reference to him. So, so the fact is, is there's a lot that's been written about Thomas or credited to Thomas, but it is all, virtually all of it is called non-canonical, which just means that it didn't get into the Bible and isn't considered sacred literature. Now there's a whole other topic for another day, but... I would recommend you get into that sometime in one of your classes or small groups. So what does it mean to have something in the canon of Scripture or not? Well, the main thing you need to know is a lot of legends about the apostles and their times after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And some of the legends are probably a little more true than others. But what you do whenever you canvas enough people like detectives do is you get a pretty clear picture of what really happened. And so there are things we do know about Thomas. Some of the things we know about him are, for example, it says in Scripture that he was known as the twin. Well, here's something funny that I discovered. It turns out Thomas is his Greek name. His Hebrew name was Judas. So that means there's three Judases among the twelve. There's a couple of Jameses. There's a couple of Simons. You know, they had nicknames because, you know, Jesus was probably needed nicknames to tell them apart. Anybody watching The Chosen right now? You know, he's got nicknames for these guys. I mean, heck, you know, when you're on a team with other people, you have nicknames for each other, right? It's a sign of affection, but it's also easy, quick communication, right? And, and so he was called the twin. Now, the interesting thing is, is that, that we don't know whether he literally had a twin brother or sister, and we don't know whether it was an identical twin or whatever, because we don't have any reference beyond that nickname. But there's a legend that says that Thomas had a striking resemblance to Jesus, and that's why they called him the twin. Well, that's interesting. You take it for what it's worth. I did the reading, so you don't have to. But here's, here's the thing. He was almost certainly a, a craftsman or a tradesman like Jesus, we tend to refer to Jesus as a carpenter, but historically what we really know is, is that he's more likely kind of a, a general contractor. You know, he worked with all the available materials of the day. And he and his dad would have had a business of helping people, you know, in many ways with their various needs around their homes and various building projects in the communities, for example. And Thomas seems to have been a similar guy. In fact, I get the impression from his pragmatism, he was probably a middle manager in the construction business because he's kind of bossy. He's good at ordering people around. And, and history, uh, historical legend says that he dispatched other disciples 
on various missions of proclaiming the gospel and everything. So you kind of get the impression that he's a foreman in, uh, in his mindset. And he, you know, is very direct, very uh, uh, matter of fact about things, very, very committed to getting things done efficiently. And uh, so, you know, he's probably a really good sergeant or something like that in a sense. And, and so you get the impression that Thomas is like that. And uh, he, uh, he seems to have spent most of his life ministering to other working class people. That's the impression I get. Now, as my friend Frank Viola likes to say, here's where we have to use our sanctified imagination. Because now it's a bit of storytelling based on the existent facts. And, and what we begin to realize is, is that he was a guy who seemed to, to relate to people in the working class, on a working class sort of level. And that kind of steered his ministry because he followed the work. One of the things we forget about the apostles is that they were all um, uh, what we would call in ministry bivocational. They were all people who had to earn their keep even while they were proclaiming the gospel. So Paul famously made tents and various types of awnings and things like that. And so, you know, he probably carried a pouch with him that had his preferred tools for such things. Well, Thomas was probably the same way. He probably had, you know, his tool belt, right? And he carried what he needed from place to place. And he signed on to help people with various projects. And, and then he witnessed to them. While he worked, <laughs> I just had a dumb thought. And as my wife will tell you, I just say it usually without thinking. There's that song from the Disney movie, Whistle While You Work, you know? He witnessed why he worked. <laughs> anyway, I'm really sorry I went there. <laughs> but I'll probably do it again. So there's the thing that I want to focus on with the next few minutes. Here is a guy on this Labor Day weekend that we can celebrate because he labored and witnessed in the same spirit. He did what needed to be done to provide for his food and lodging for the people that he probably traveled with. People seldom travel alone. That's a pretty dangerous thing to do, even today. And so, you know, he probably had a little entourage of people that he traveled with and, and people who kind of latched on to him when they caught on to what he was teaching and preaching, and they did that with the apostles. We tend to take that for granted, too, that, that, that the, the sad thing about the deaths of the apostles is they just passed on, as we all do, is that gradually, over time, we became more distant from their testimony. And... You know, you've probably played that game of telegraph with uh, various experiences in your life where you start with something whispered in an ear at one end of the building and then you try to find out what it came out like at the other end of the building and it's usually distorted. And so it was with the traditions of the apostles. So it's important that we come back to as best we can the roots of things. And so... This testimony of, of Thomas was probably something that happened in a very organic way. He's, he's fixing somebody's broken door, you know. He's, he's at someone's home saying, well, you know, if you put me up for a couple of nights and feed me, um, I can take care of some of these things for you in exchange. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, that's a great deal. And so what's he doing? He's breaking bread with them. And they said, well, so what brings you to town anyway, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You know why I'm here? I'll tell you. And then you tell what you've seen and what you know. It's so easy. That's why we call it witnessing. That's why they call it giving your testimony. I mean, a lot of religious terms get distorted by religious people. But in the end, words usually mean what they appear to mean. I'm kind of stuck on that concept, as some of you know. I, I just figure that words mean what they say and say what they mean. And in this case, sharing your testimony means this is what I've heard, this is what I've seen, this is what I know. The other day, I witnessed a minor accident on uh, one of our streets here in town. And when a police officer came, he asked me what I saw, what I heard, and I told him, and then I left, and that was that. But I gave my testimony. I shared my witness. 
And in the same way you do when you tell people about your relationship with Jesus. And as I've mentioned in previous weeks, when you don't have much to tell, you should ask yourself why. Which is why I've invited you to join me on this discipleship pathway and to use some of the resources that I've created. And, uh, and, and they're not original to me in the, in the sense that I don't have any new profound thing to say. I've just put it in my own words and somehow these are things that can help you. Um, Heck, I've got right here, I've got a, three questionnaires that I give to people when they say they want to get on the discipleship pathway. And it helps you figure out where you are. Because maybe the, st- the reason you don't feel like you have a story to tell is because you don't. Or you haven't organized your story in a way that gives you something to tell. But once you have, then you can be like Thomas. You find that relatability that comes naturally in your life those times and places where you are right in the midst of people you could share your story with and again some of us have grown up with this distorted thing that some Christians do that makes it sound like you're supposed to have some sort of pitch that you've practiced you know Maybe, maybe you tried Amway or something and you learned the, the, the plan and you shared it with somebody. Or maybe you, you know, or like me, you were selling things for a living and you, you uh, learned how to do the walk around and explain all the features and benefits. And all of that's really helpful. But in the end, anybody could share their testimony in a setting that's very natural for them. For example, I see sports parents out here. How many times have you sat on those horrible aluminum bleachers, either frying or freezing your bottom? You have something in common with everyone else sitting on those aluminum bleachers right there and then. And that, in its very essence, is an opportunity for witness and testimony. You know? You just have to see it for what it is. You just have to recognize it. You have to have a story to tell. Thomas, he could tell people what he knew. Don't you think Thomas said to people, you know, I remember when they told me he was alive and I said, I ain't buying it. Oh, I'll bet he told that story 10,000 times. Yep, I told him, not unless I put my hand in his side, then I'll believe. And boy, was I shocked when there he stood in front of me. And truth is, I didn't need to put my hand on anything. I knew the minute he said my name, I knew when I saw him, it was true. And I fell to my knees and said, my Lord and my God. Don't you think he told that story just about like that? And what do you suppose that did to the people who heard it? Have you had an experience like that? I'm going to bet that some of the people in this room who have been going through a lot of difficulty lately, like Laura and I have experienced at different times in our lives, have a story to tell. Well, you see, it was like this before, and then this happened, and now it's like this. See, we all have that. I used to sell things for a living when I was in my 20s and before I went into ministry in my 30s, I'd gotten fairly good at it. And I know some of you are probably going, yeah. But here's the thing. There was a thing that I had to do regularly that was not fun, but it was a natural part of representing a company that occasionally didn't serve our customers well. And that was deal with complaints. Deal with angry, frustrated people. And what I learned was a little trick that some sales conference taught me sometime back in the 1980s. And it's the feel, felt, found. All right? Now, you're going to want to write this down because this is life-changing. This will make your life better. Learn to say feel, felt, found. Ah, it's another triple F. Anybody with me? Just call me the rubber brand man. Feel, felt, found. Oh my, I understand how you feel. You know, I have felt that way myself. Here's what I found. Now you just figured out the easy way to have an organic testimony. Don't you think Thomas did this on a regular basis? 
I've heard about you Christians. You are really stirring up trouble. The Jews are mad. And then when they get mad, the Romans get mad. You guys are really making, you know what? I understand how you feel. In fact, I've felt that way myself at times. And here's what I found. It helps to find the truth under the rumor. It helps to bore deeply into what's really going on. And then you find that things aren't the way you heard they were. See, this is a natural thing that testifiers or witnesses or pro uh, people who proclaim the gospel do. It's an organic expression. And I think old Tom was really good at that. He wasn't a big talker, a big, you know, speech maker. He probably just said, yep, I understand how you feel. <laughs> I felt that way myself. Here's what I found. Do you know how you could tell people about the saving relationship with Jesus Christ that you've experienced? It could be just that simple. You know, I felt hopeless at times too. And here's what I found. I prayed through my difficulties and I never seemed to get the answer that I wanted. But what I found was God was faithful. This is what he did. I'll tell you a little secret. 90% of the sermons I preach on Sunday morning are simply an elaborate version of Feel, Felt, Found. And now you know. So who's preaching next week? No volunteers? Okay, yeah, yeah, of you... course. So, you know, this, this is really like... I'm just using Thomas as an excuse, to be honest with you, to share what I call blue-collar evangelism, just working-class evangelism. And it could be for anybody. It really doesn't matter what your station in life is. Some people just don't need a lot of song, dance, or show. Some people are suspicious of certain kinds of language and certain sort of ways that you present yourself. And can I be honest with you? Most of you have a more powerful testimony than I do because you don't have my job title. Because people tend to resist my testimony because they assume that it goes with the job. You know, like, like I have a recruiting quota or something like over at the military branches, you know, and, uh, and, and it's, like, it's like, you know, you have a powerful testimony because you're just you. And that's a good thing, because you are pretty awesome. You have done amazing things in your life that other people can relate to. And what you have to learn to do in order to share your faith with others is to recognize that that's your craft, that that's your trade. So you don't necessarily have to have a job like Thomas's or something like that. Maybe you work in an, an environment where you don't really feel that it's, it's safe or wise to, to share your faith. But the reality is, is there's so much about you that becomes an expression of your faith. So much about you that can be transferred to others because we are living in a time right now when mental illness and emotional and spiritual sickness is rampant. Where all that isolation and everything we went through has got people feeling really lonely. And you know what they need more than anybody? Is somebody who sincerely can say, I hear how you feel. And I want to reassure you, because I have felt that way too, and this is what I found. Do you know how many people need that right now? And at that moment, you have permission to say, and what I found is, is that even when I don't understand what Jesus is up to, I can't help loving and trusting him, and that is why I can sleep at night. Okay? I mean... You have a story to tell. And if you, get the, if you have the good fortune of having the day off tomorrow, why don't you spend some time thinking about the story? Why don't you think about how you have felt at times and what you found? Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your power to take every one of our stories and turn it into a testimony that glorifies you. Oh God, we're so grateful. 
that you have saved us despite our unworthiness and then made us better than the sum of our parts so that every one of us has a testimony, a story to tell. And we just invite you to awaken us to that and then enhance our story with your divine energy. Amen.